So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, you can just take a seat. So we'll go ahead and go before the Lord in prayer. And then we'll begin our lesson this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for allowing us to gather together here. We ask that you would help us as we endeavor to study this morning your righteousness, your justice. Help us in our feeble attempts to understand and comprehend uh, uh, you. We know you have disclosed yourself to us in your word, that we might know you, and that we might know you in a saving relationship. Help us to grow in our knowledge of you, grow, grow in our knowledge of of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and that we might, in our lives, worship you and exercise good works to the glory of God the Father. And we ask these things, and that your Son would be exalted in this lesson this morning, that he would be preeminent, that he would be made much of, and that uh, we might, um, in our hearts and in our minds, Come to know you even more. We ask these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this morning, our study is going to be on divine righteousness and justice. So we're going to be looking at both. So what I'd like to do this morning is first go through a, a couple passages. The scripture is replete with... Texts dealing with God's righteousness, so I have to be selective on what we will discuss. But I'd like to read uh, three, three psalms. So, Psalm 145, verse 17. And we dealt with Psalm 145 in the past, but not this particular psalm. So, Psalm 145, verse 17, it says... The Lord is righteous in all his ways, and kind in all his works. The term righteousness here in Hebrew, it's the Hebrew term sadak, which means just, in the right, upright. So in this particular context, it's saying that, that God is upright, he's, he's just, he's in the right. That's why we say righteous. God is righteous. <coughs> and notice in the definition of Sadak, just and right are used. They're synonymous. Now, in Hebrew and in Greek, there are specific root words that surround this idea of righteousness and justice. And often they can be used interchangeably. They can be synonymous. So I will, this morning, show a distinction between the two, but they are so inter related and overlap that at times they, they are synonymous. So another psalm, Psalm 711, if, if you'd like you can turn there, if not I'll read it. Psalm 711, 
I do enjoy the King James Version, the rendering of this verse, but the ESV, it says, God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. I think the King James off the top of my house says, God is a righteous judge and uh, is angry with the wicked every day. I think that's what the King James says. But it's the idea that God is a, a righteous judge. And it designates God as a judge. Right? And we think of a judge in terms of justice, serving justice. And here in this context it says that God is righteous and that he is a judge. The last psalm that we'll look at is Psalm 89, verse 14. It says, Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. So it says that justice and judgment are the habitation of God's throne. Again, emphasizing that God is just. It designates God's justice to him before his throne. And we think of the throne as, as the, the judgment seat, the throne in which God sits. What's on there? Psalm 89, verse 14. Oh, that's all right. So now to our, our main texts this morning. So we're going to look at two texts in depth. We're going to look at Isaiah chapter 45. So please turn there, Isaiah 45. This particular passage deals with Cyrus, the Lord appointing Cyrus. But we're going to look at verses 19 through 25 in Isaiah 45. So Isaiah 45, starting at verse 19. I did not speak in secret in a land of darkness. I did not say to the offspring of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, you survivors of the nations. They have no knowledge who carry about their wooden idols and keep on praying to a God that cannot save. Declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told this long ago? Who declared it of old? Was it not I, the Lord? And there is no other God besides me. A righteous God and a Savior. There is none besides me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me, pardon me, to me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, or to me every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall swear allegiance. Only in the Lord it shall be said of me, our righteousness and strength. To him shall come and be ashamed all who are incensed against him. So verse 19. It says, I declare what is right. So God reveals and declares what is right. Look at verse 21. A righteous God and Savior. There is none besides me. God alone is righteous. All righteousness derives from Him. And look further at verse 24. Only in the Lord it shall be said of me are righteousness and strength. We can only have righteousness because it comes from God. God is our strength. God is our righteousness. <coughs> God alone is the source of righteousness and strength. Let's turn to our final passage. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. 
So the Apostle Paul wrote, under inspiration, Romans chapter 3, and we're going to look at verses 21 through 26 this morning. But now the righteousness of God has been manifest apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And are justified by his faith. Pardon me. And, ju and are justified by his grace as a gift. Through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Or Christ Jesus. Whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. To be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now throughout this passage there is this Greek term. Let me see if I can, let me look at it here. So it's Dikos, hold on, dikosume, 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 theu. So dikosume theu, it means righteousness or justice of God. This phrase can refer both to righteousness as an attribute of God or to the righteousness of God reckoned to believers. Imputed righteousness, right? Now we're going to look through these passages. So verse Let's look at verse 1. Verse 1. But now the righteousness of God has been manifest apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God has come to us apart from obedience to the law. That is to say, it's apart from works righteousness. It's apart from law keeping. And it is testified in the law and the prophets. It's testified in the law and the prophets. Think back in Genesis. It talks about Abraham. His faith was counted as righteousness. We think about in all the Old Testament, the prophecies talking about the suffering servant, the, the Messiah that's going to come, right? We think of Isaiah chapter 53, right? The Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. You can look at Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4. And Psalm 32, verses 1 through 2. So this is testified in the Old Testament. Verse 22 of our text. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. The imputed, that is to say the accounted, the charged, the reckoned, the credited righteousness of Jesus Christ... To all who exercise faith in him. Jesus Christ, very God and very man, lived the perfect life you and I daily fail to live. He lived in obedience to the law. His active obedience. He voluntarily went to the cross. He suffered and died. His passive obedience in our place to pay the penalty for our sins. This is called... The penal substitutionary atonement. He died in our place. Think of, I, think of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For our sakes he, that is to say God, made him, Jesus Christ, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Amen. At the cross, our sin is credited to Christ's account. And Christ's righteousness is credited to our account by grace through faith alone. Verse 23 of our text. For all have sinned. This is a familiar passage, right? For all have sinned. All are sinners. We are sinners by inheritance, by imputation, and by imitation. In Adam, we are born with a sinful nature, and we are imputed, that is to say, charged with his guilt. Hence, we copy each other's sinful behaviors. It's, it's 
We, it's not merely that we, we come into this world and then we just learn it. No, no, sin is much deeper than that. We, we don't learn it. We, we have it in us. And then it manifests itself. Our, our sinful heart, our condition is manifested in, in actions, right? But those actions come from somewhere. It comes from the heart. Our heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. We're sinful. And fall short of the glory of God. We fail to conform to God's image. God's glorious image, we fail to conform to it. We fall short or lack the blessing of God's approval on us, which was possessed prior to the fall. Adam and Eve, before they, they sinned, they, they had approval before God. And when they sinned, we all sinned in Him. We think of Romans chapter 5. Verse 24. And are justified. This term justified, it's very important. Wayne Grudem defines justification in this way. Justification is an instantaneous legal act of God in which he thinks of our sins as forgiven and Christ's righteousness as belonging to us and declares us to be righteous in his sight. So justification, to be right before God, that's important. It's of significant importance. And how is this? It's by his grace as a gift. Justification is freely given. And thus it cannot be earned, and nor can it be deserved. So contrary to the Roman Catholic Church, no matter what the Pope says, no matter what um, the Roman Catholic tradition states, justification can only be given by God through grace, through faith. It's by faith we are justified. Think of Martin Luther. When he read... Uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, when it struck him that when he realized what this meant, we have the Reformation that came, right? Ushered through by God's providence. When, when we truly understand the significance of this, it, it, it will change us, right? It, it will just, it will transform our hearts and minds. Let's keep going. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, the accomplished redemption this redemptive work of, of Jesus Christ in his perfect life, his suffering, his death, his burial, his resurrection. He paid the penalty for our sins and thus delivered us from the guilt, the punishment, and the power of sin. That's what he accomplished. Verse 25, whom God put forward as a propitiation. We don't use that term often, propitiation. Whom God put forward. Our triune God, the Father, appointed the Son. The Son accomplished redemption for us. And the Holy Spirit applies that to us. Regenerates us. And how is this? The Son, when he, when he died on the cross, he was our propitiation. He took the wrath of God upon himself. This term propitiation means it's, it's wrath appeasing. It means mercy seat. It's wrath appeasing or wrath removing. Jesus Christ took the wrath of God on our behalf. By his blood, to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness. Because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. God did not swiftly execute justice until the appointed time in which justice was definitively served by Jesus' sacrificial death. In Christ... God's justice was vindicated. It was served. Verse 26. That he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God can consistently be just and justify sinners. He can do both. And that is because of Jesus Christ. By his life, death, burial, and resurrection, God can remain just and justify us who are sinful. Now, some theologians, there's always controversy, right? With, in theology, there, there is people that disagree. Now, some theologians argue God's righteousness refers merely to covenantal faithfulness. Now, who am I thinking of when I talk about this? I'm thinking of something called the New Perspective on Paul. 
Specifically, N.T. Wright is the theologian that, that advocates this. So they say, when we talk about God's righteousness, it just means covenantal faithfulness. God, God being faithful to his covenant. Now, what do we say of this? I would say that such an interpretation is wrong-headed. It reduces the rich concept of righteousness to merely covenantal faithfulness. Now, of course, covenantal faithfulness is entailed by God's righteousness. No doubt about it. But we cannot reduce God's righteousness to merely covenantal faithfulness. Because covenantal faithfulness itself does not convey the full meaning of righteousness. For example, what is the opposite of righteousness? Let me ask you guys. What's the opposite of righteousness? This isn't a trick question. Sin, Sin sure, but more specific. Unrighteousness. Unrighteousness, right? Think of Romans chapter 1, verse 18, right? For the wrath of God is revealed from the, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, right? So unrighteousness, ungodliness, right? That's the opposite of righteousness. So it's not merely covenantal unfaithfulness, according to the Apostle Paul, who, 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 who wrote Romans in, under inspiration. We can go further than that. Moreover, if we assume, let's assume, let's assume for the sake of argument that righteousness is merely covenantal faithfulness. That God keeps his promises, he keeps his covenants. Let's assume that. Then only those people in the covenant can be righteous or unrighteous. That's, that's the conclusion of that. If, if God sets a covenant, only people that are faithful or disobedient to the covenant can be called righteous or unrighteous according to this view. Well, let's think about that. Gentiles are outside the covenant made to Israel, thus cannot be righteous nor unrighteous. That would be the, that would be the consequence of this view. But let's think about it. Who in the scriptures was before the covenant and was righteous? We just studied a book in our home fellowship group. What was that person's name? Job. Job. Job was before the covenant. Was he righteous? Yes. He was righteous. So this, this idea that righteousness is synonymous, that it means covenantal faithfulness, cannot be true. Because we have clear example or clear testimony in scripture that someone is righteous apart from the covenant. Apart from the covenant made with Israel. So what would we say? So we should interpret God's righteousness in two ways. Firstly, as a moral attribute in which God always does what is morally right and just. Consequently, this entails God always is faithful to his covenants. He never breaks his promises. Secondly, God's righteousness refers to a legal status of righteousness to be declared righteous or just in the sight of God. Through God to those through faith in Jesus Christ. So that's how we should understand Righteousness, and we're going to develop that further. So that's going to conclude the, um, the, scriptural, the scriptural teaching that I've looked at this morning. There are so many more scriptures that we can go over. But I've only selected a few this morning. So let's go ahead now and turn to our summary, trying to, trying to summarize what is righteousness. What is divine righteousness? This idea that God is righteous and that God is just. So remember when we discussed God's goodness? When we, when we studied God's goodness, we stated his goodness is the substance contained by his righteousness. And I gave the example, I couldn't help but think about, I was thinking of a jelly jar, right? The Smucker's jelly jar, and, and I was thinking of the jelly jar, and I'm thinking of the jelly, right? The jelly is the substance, the stuff in the jar, right? And I was thinking the goodness of God is like, Strawberry jelly, the stuff, and then the container is, the ordered container is God's righteousness, if I could put it that way, in a reverent way. So, <laughs> yes, so, so I, I was quoting John Frame, and I want to continue to quote him. So John Frame explains God's righteousness. He says, the main idea of divine righteousness is that God acts according to a perfect internal standard of right and wrong. All his actions are within the limits, if we can use that term reverently, of that standard. 
So righteousness is the form, the structure of God's goodness. And his goodness is the concrete, active embodiment of his righteousness. End quote. So God, God's always, God always does what is morally right and just since God's will, his character, his nature is the standard for right and wrong. And I, I, I think that that is what is, that is the conclusion of what Dr. Frame says in the quote that I just quoted. Now, when we discussed, when we discussed God's goodness, we talked about, and we went a little deep into it, but we talked about the difference between moral values and moral duties. Moral values and moral duties, right? When we talked about God's goodness, I gave you this example. I said, suppose right now, let's say I inherited a million dollars, right? And I donated it to Grace Bible Church, right? I used this example. What did I say? I said that that would be a good thing if I give a million dollars to Grace Bible Church, right? But is it my moral obligation to do that? No, it's not. But it would be a good thing if I did. That would be a moral good, not a moral duty, right? There's a difference between a moral good or moral value and a moral duty. What is, what is, what is, duty stands for what is right, right? And it deals with obligations, what we must do, what we ought to do. Now remember the dilemma I, I, I discussed last time? We called it the Euthyphro dilemma. Well, we're going to revisit that, but this time we're going to look at it in terms of God's righteousness. Last time we talked about goodness, this time we're going to talk about Righteousness. So let's 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 uh, let's discuss the dilemma. So is something morally right because God wills it to be morally right, or is it morally right and therefore God wills it? This is Euthyphro's dilemma. And remember, Euthyphro is a character in, in uh, Plato's dialogue entitled Euthyphro. And in that dialogue, Euthyphro, one of one of the one of the characters of Plato, he goes to the Athenian court to sue his father. And Socrates is talking with uh, Euthyphro, and this is where that dilemma comes from. So, is something right because God simply says so, or is something right and that's why God says it's right? Which one is it? Do you guys recall what we said? Well, it really can't be either, because right, God is righteousness. So, it, it flows from Him. Right. And so... There is, there is no dilemma, right. be, because you, got, you don't, God doesn't, it, it would mean there was something higher than God if there were a dilemma, that he would have to follow it because it was right. Right, absolutely. Um, I, we could phrase it this other way, does God on a whim approve an action morally right, or is an action morally right independent of God's approval? And you, you've, already, you've already outlined exactly my point here. I was going to say, if what is right is arbitrary, then God can approve any action that is morally right. Stealing or adultery could be morally right if God so will, which is absurd. Right? However, if what is right is a standard God must comply with, then that standard is God. If there's a standard above God, and God has to comply with it, then that standard is above God, and therefore that standard is God. Right? And both of those are, uh, both options are not correct. Right? And that's why last time when we discussed God's goodness, we said that this dilemma is false. It's a false dilemma. Christian theologians have always argued that, well, I, I shouldn't say always. There are, I should say this. Most Christian most. theologians, most Christian theologians have argued God approves something as right because he is good and righteous. God doesn't, God doesn't, um, let me put it this way. God doesn't simply set the standard, right? He, does, he doesn't create the standard. It's not a standard that is above him. He is the standard. Amen. He is the standard. And that's why when he, when, he, when, he, when he legislates laws, they are consistent with who and what he is. So righteousness is perfect conformity to the moral laws God legislated to free creatures, humans, angels, based on his goodness and righteousness. Now, I want, to make, I want to make a point, though. God is not bound by any moral law. Think about that. God is not bound by any moral laws. Nevertheless, God may voluntarily legislate laws that are binding to himself. We think of covenants. We think of promises. 
Now, to make sense of this, philosophers provide a helpful distinction, and I'll just quickly go through this again, because I did discuss it last time. This distinction between following a rule and acting in accordance to a rule. God naturally is morally good and righteous, thus acts in accordance to our rule following or law keeping, even though he is not strictly bound to any of the laws he legislates. So I, I hope that's clear, this, this distinction between uh, law keeping, or pardon me, the distinction between following a rule and acting in accordance to a rule. Following a rule and acting in accordance to a rule. We keep God's law, right? We, we, uh, we keep the rule, as it were. Whereas God, he acts in accordance with the rule, but or he acts in accordance he acts in accordance with the laws that he gives us, but technically, tr strictly speaking, he is not bound by any moral laws. Why is that? Because to have a moral law means would imply there's a moral law giver. There is no other God except one God, the one true God, the triune God. And that's why we, we should say, um, we, we should keep this distinction in mind. Now, we've discussed divine righteousness. Any discussion on divine righteousness? Any questions? Because we're going to go now to divine, right, to divine justice. We're going we're to move on now to uh, nuance divine justice. So, divine justice. Perhaps when you think of justice, you <coughs> contemplate the principle that people get what they deserve, right? You think about justice, you think of people getting, what, getting their just deserves. Right? We think of that, that's ingrained in our culture. Think of Plato, Plato's Republic. So what do we say? And, and I, should, I should say that that is a biblical principle. We see that in Romans chapter 2, verse 6. So what should we say about divine justice? Both God's justice and moral equity, that is, that is to say fairness, God's fairness, is established by his righteousness. God legislates moral laws to his creatures in the form of rectoral justice. God enforces those laws, he legislates as distributive justice in terms of rewards, remunerative justice, and punishments. We all know about punishments, retributive justice, right? Now God possesses the legislative office, if we think of our own, if we think of our own government, right? God possesses the legislative office, he makes the laws. The executive office, he, impl he implements the laws. And the judicial office, God is the Supreme Court. He is the ultimate authority. He is the ultimate court of appeal. And he, he is all these in his moral government. God is the righteous moral lawgiver and just judge over all creation. <coughs> now, in virtue of God's justice, there are two things that God cannot do. First, he cannot punish an innocent person. Second, he cannot leave the guilty unpunished. We think of Exodus chapter 34. Now, I want to make this point. In virtue of, or, or just thinking about, these facts that I've just given you, that God cannot punish an innocent person, and God must punish sin, right? What, what, what first comes to mind? What we just discussed earlier, when we looked at Romans chapter 3. This is why the imputed righteousness of Christ and his sacrificial death as our substitute was necessary for our salvation. God must punish sin, and that's why Christ had to die. Romans chapter 3, we said that God is, God is just and he's the justifier, right? That's why Jesus came. That we might, we who are unjust might be justified. We who are unrighteous might become righteous. We who are imperfect might become perfect because of Jesus Christ. Now what, what do we make of application? What do we make of application on God's righteousness and justice? We are unrighteous, so we must find our righteousness not in ourselves, but in God through Christ. It is not in what we do, but it is in what Christ has done that is acceptable before God. When the incarnate Son, the second person of the divine trinity, Jesus Christ, 
was nailed to that Latin cross, he was our substitute. He bore the wrath of God. He bore it in our place. He paid the penalty for our sins. He absorbed the wrath of God, the condemnation, the death we deserved. He took it upon himself. And he did this voluntarily. Our sins were charged to him, and his righteousness is credited to us by faith in him. He both satisfied God's justice and demonstrated God's grace to justify us by faith alone, in Christ alone, apart from the works of the law. And if I had, if I, if I could illustrate this, I don't have, I, I don't think I can illustrate it precisely, but all illustrations fall. Right? Every illustration breaks down, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and give you an illustration, and it's not, it's not perfect. There are many holes in it, but I'd like to give it to you anyways. So um, when I did Evangelism Explosion many years ago, James D. Kennedy would use this, in, this uh, illustration to make this point. So I'm going to use it this morning if we have time. So here is the illustration visually. So suppose there is a record book, and you can think of this up for yourself. I'm going I'm to use myself as the example. Suppose there's a record book of me, all of my past, present, and future sins. There's a record, there's a record book, right? It's all contained in this book. And if I could do this reverently, let's say that my Bible is that book, right? All my sins are in it, right? They belong to me. And let's say that this hand is me, it represents me. My sin, it belongs to me, so it's on, it, it, it's on me. It's all on me. I earned it. So it's my sin, right? All my sin is on, all my sin is upon me. Now let's say, if we can be reverent in this, let's say my left hand is God. Our triune glory is God. And he has decreed to disclose himself. He's made himself known. And he wants a relationship with me, right? But my sin separates me from God, right? It's, uh, my sins are ever before me. And they separate me from God. Now what do I do to try to deal with it? I try to turn my life around. I try to turn over a new leaf. I do all these things, but they don't deal with my sin. My sin still remains there. I haven't done anything to take away my guilt. My sin is still there. So God, he wants a relationship with me, but my sin separates me. So what does God do? The second person of the Trinity condescends, comes down, right? He comes down. And what does he do? The scripture says that he that knew no sin became sin for us, right? The Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Christ took my sin, right? Now, the reason why this analogy isn't perfect is because I don't have a white book to put on myself, right? Because Christ doesn't merely take our sin away, his righteousness is imputed to us. That is to say, when God sees us, he sees Christ's righteousness. And this is a legal act. It's not like, uh, it's not like I'm, I, there's righteousness in my person. No, it's that God, when God sees us in Christ, he sees Christ's righteousness. Now, with my analogy, my sin is taken away by Christ so that God is able to have fellowship with me, right? Now the analogy or the illustration is not perfect, but it illustrates the point that, that Christ, he took our punishment upon himself. And because he took, his pun he took the punishment, his atonement paid the penalty for our sins, God could be righteous and just to forgive us and that we might be able to go to heaven and be with him because Christ's righteousness is charged. That is to say, um, Credited to our account. My second point. We are to reflect on God's righteousness in the world. This is accomplished in three aspects. We must know the truth of God. We are to be grounded in the word of God. We are to study and learn the precious doctrines of the truth. We are, we are to show the truth of God. How do we do that? We defend our faith with sound arguments. 
We live a life that is blameless, that is above reproach. We mortify sin. We, we, we exercise and do good works, not to inherit anything, but because we love God. And we must share the truth of God. We preach the gospel to everyone, to our family, to our friends, to our neighbors, to strangers, to everybody, right? The, the gospel should go forth indiscriminately to everybody. And what we need to do is we need to know the truth, we need to show the truth, and we need to share the truth. We need to do all three. And by doing so, we are going to reflect and mirror God's righteousness to a lost and dying world. My next point. Remember when we discussed <coughs> we discussed uh, Psalm 139. We discussed. I, I mentioned that we weren't going to talk about abortion at that time, but it was relevant to the issue of abortion, right? Well, think about God's justice in, in light of that. We must advocate justice for the helpless and innocent. We are to defend the rights. To life for the unborn. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 and 17. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. Hands that shed innocent blood. We should advocate for those that cannot advocate for themselves. We should advocate for justice. For the unborn. My next point. If the, federal, if the federal and state governments enacted laws that conflict with God's laws, then we must obey we pardon me, we must obey God's laws and disobey the unjust laws. Because God's justice takes priority. If our nation, for whatever reasons, enacted unjust laws, let's say that what if they what, what if the what if uh, what if California or what if the federal government said, bow to Caesar? You must bow to Caesar. What are we going to do? Are we going to bow to Caesar or are we going to say Jesus is Lord? If the government comes to us and says, we're going to execute you unless you bow to Caesar, what are you going to say? You're going to say, come what may, Jesus is Lord. <laughs> execute him, right? Well, that's what we should do. The scripture says... We think, of, we think of Acts chapter 5. What did the Apostle Peter say when, um, when the, uh, I believe the, it was the Roman government, they were telling them to stop preaching. What did he say? We must obey God rather than men. That should be our attitude. God's justice takes priority over our own, our own, our own government. And uh, obviously, we have to be consistent. The scripture says that God has put our, in Romans chapter 13, God has put the authorities in the position that they're in. So we are to obey their laws, right? We're to obey the laws of land. But if they conflict with God's laws, God's law supersedes man's laws. Think of Daniel, King Nebuchadnezzar. Worship this idol. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what did, what did, what did they do? Did they, did they worship? No, they didn't. No, they didn't. That should be our attitude. The injustices and moral wrongs we may face in this life will find justice and be made right on the day of judgment. That should, be, that should give us hope that um, even though this life we may experience many things, they will find their, they will find their fulfillment, they will find justice, the wrongs will be made right. At the day of judgment. Now that concludes my notes. Any discussion? Any questions? Um, so I, I guess we have to look to eternity and hell. When uh, we look, I, I believe it's Job chapter 21 where he talks about um, people who are evil, yet they seem to prosper, their children seem to prosper, they go to the grave, their children inherit the money, and they, they seem to 
So it would seem that in this world, they live a life where they never got any right treatment. Just, you know, just. Yes, yes. And um, so, comment. Comment, um, sure. So when we study the book of Job, um, Job's miserable counselors, his friends, right? His friends. Yeah. They had a very, um, they had a, a, an imbalanced view of justice. Mm -hmm. They thought that justice always, retributive, retributive justice always takes place in this life. Right. And the scripture is very clear that, that God's providence, he, you know, he shows his good mercies to all creation. There's common grace. Mm -hmm. And that's why the wicked, it's possible for the wicked to prosper, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, common grace, absolutely. But you're correct, Carl, that, that ultimate justice will find its fulfillment. It, it, it finds its definitive fulfillment either in Christ or on... Either we're going to be found in Christ or we're going to be found in our sins, which we're going to, we're going to receive retributive justice where we will, we, will be, we, will, we will experience death, right? It's, we're going to go to hell if, if we... We're going to experience condemnation. Maybe I should put it that way since we've dealt with Romans chapter 3. They will experience condemnation. Either Christ took the wrath of God on our behalf, or we will, as Dr. MacArthur would, pay, would say, there's this divine layaway. Sin now, pay later. Right? <laughs> that's, 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 how, that's how it goes. Right? So we will end up, we will experience it either, either we will experience God's wrath at the day of judgment, or Christ took that wrath on our behalf. And for those of you that are unbelievers, that resist trusting in Christ, we'd urge you to think seriously about what we've discussed this morning. That um, God's righteousness should impress upon you the fact that God's sin must be punished. It must be dealt with. And it, it's either dealt with on the cross, or it's dealt with you getting the just condemnation you will receive on the day of judgment. Any additional questions? Right. Yes. You said Owen. something about uh, God doesn't punish the righteous. Correct. But well, I said God doesn't punish the innocent. The innocent, right? right? Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. What happened to Job? He just he doesn't punish him, but he allows yeah to be punished. Yeah. Um, do you? Rec I can actually discuss that. It's not what we discussed this morning, but. Um, okay. Specifically, but I most certainly can see here. If I can get my notes, I've actually dealt with that. Let's see here. So, in the case of Job, the scriptures clearly state that he was righteous, right? But God allows God allows him to to, to uh, go through and experience great suffering, great affliction. Right? And I apologize, I'm right now trying to get my notes. So while I'm doing that, I don't have them up. I don't know how much time, we're probably almost out of time, but I'll quickly try and go through it for you. Three minutes. Three minutes, okay. Okay. All right. So, Job, in the account of Job, there were two intentions, right? God and Satan. God intended good for Job, and Satan intended evil. Satan directly produced all the evils Job suffered, yet God planned and permitted Satan to inflict such evils. God planned and permitted Satan to inflict such evils to bring about a weightier good that were dependent upon the evils inflicted, namely, to vindicate God's worthiness to be served for who he is and not merely for what he gives. Amen. So that would be the reason why God would allow such evil to, to uh, befall upon Job. And remember our discussion. I only have three minutes, all right? So we'll go through. Remember our discussion about evil, right? What were some of the doctrinal, uh, the doctrinal observations on evil? I said that God is absolutely good. He is righteous. And therefore, he created all things good as a reflection of himself. But the second point I said is that God created the angels and the first humans, Adam and Eve, good with the ability to, to choose good or evil, right and wrong. And that's relevant when we discuss righteousness, right and wrong. Now, evil and sin entered the world by God's creatures misusing 
misusing or distorting good. Now, God ordained the entrance of evil for his glory and our good. God did not directly and actively create evil, hence he cannot be blamed for evil. Evil comes from the creature, not the creator. We, and then this last point, we are cognitively limited to understand God's inscrutable ways, yet we can take great comfort and assurance in his sovereignty and his righteousness. So we go ahead, pause. Well, so your point to this question is that as far as Job goes, it was not God punishing Job, it was God allowing for evil to befall him or to yeah. So there's a distinction between what you're saying, God's righteousness, he does not punish the innocent. Correct. That's what you're saying. Right. Correct. And that's why the imputed righteousness of Christ is so important that we understand. That, um, that's why I made that point earlier, because some people will say, well, then what about the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ? Isn't Jesus innocent? Well, yes, but we have to keep in mind this idea of imputation, that we, when we're discussing Romans chapter 3, the imputation that God charges our sin to Christ. And so, in the sight of God, he is not innocent, right? And Jesus voluntarily undergoes that, right? And then when he dies... And he pays the penalty for our sins. God reckons his righteousness to us. Right? And then Jesus, he rose again on the third day and ascended to the Father. Right? And that's why um, some people will say, well, you know, what, substitutionary atonement is, is wrong. No, it's not. It's consistent with God's justice. And it's consistent with God's righteousness. All right, guys, well, we'll close. It's <laughs> great. <Spray. laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your righteousness, for, for helping us to understand and um, in, in, our, in our limited capacity to understand you. And um, even though we cannot fully comprehend, we can apprehend what you've revealed to us. For you are righteous, and we are not. For you are just, and we are not. For you are perfect, and we are not. But in Christ, we are made righteous. In Christ, we are just. In Christ, we are perfect. May we trust in him, and may we live a life that pleases you, that mirrors your righteousness for your glory and for our good. We ask these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.